Uh, kia ora tato. Um, welcome to our webinar today. I'm going to kick us off with a karakia. Tu tawa mai runga, tu tawa mai raro, tu tawa mai roto, tu tawa mai i waho, kia tawa i te mauri tu, te mauri ora, ki te katoa, haumi e, hui e, tāhiki e. No mai piki mai ki tō tātou nei wānanga, a e pāna ki te repo me ngā pāmu. Um, ko tiri ni rā te māhau, he uri tēnei nō whainui te aroa waka, e noho anau ki roto rua. Uh, ko te kaimahi a hau, pau tui tui a rohe, uh, mō te kaupapa ngā mata popore whenua, uh, e mihi ana ki a, ki a koutou. So a very big warm welcome through the screen to you all joining us uh, for today's webinar, uh, Wetlands and Your Farm Environmental Plan. Uh, we're very excited to have um, you all along. Um, during, the, um, during the webinar, we ask you to please um, use the chat box to uh, let us know who you are, where you're tuning in from, just so we know who's attending, um, and also any pātai or uh, questions, comments you have, please feel free to pop them in the chat box as we move along. Um, so we're talking wetlands Today, um, there's a big, there is a big movement of wetland restoration and construction on, across the region, uh, which is fabulous to see for the health of our waterways. And for us here in Aotearoa, um, repo is the Māori word for wetlands, um, have very um, significant cultural, spiritual, historical um, value. Um, and they're uh, extreme tonga for tangata whenua. Um, wetlands also play a big part, major part in whakapapa for te ao Māori, um, the relationship between land and water, um, filtering and cleansing all the toxins before um, any of the um, activity that might cause the water to um, have toxins is released well, through the wetland, through the repo and out into the um, tūpuna wai or ancestral water, waterways. Um, so, very significant topic, very important topic. We're uh, very uh, excited to have one of my colleagues along. Um, his name is Nathan Bukupal. Uh, Nathan is our Hawke's Bay Regional Coordinator for New Zealand Landcare Trust. Um, he comes with some 30 years of experience working in wetlands, uh, both in the US and New Zealand. So he has uh, somewhat of a global view of this mahi and the space. Um, he's worked with various regional councils, fishing game, um, and done a whole heap of work um, working with landowners, private landowners, to restore and reconstruct wetland. Um, Nathan is currently uh, working with a group down in the Hawke's Bay called Tuku Tukupo, uh, and they're looking at uh, recreating wetlands to reduce um, nitrogen in their area. So without further ado, uh, I'm sure Nathan's going to share a lot more about himself um, as we move along, but I introduce to you Nathan Berkey-Pyle. Kia ora, Nathan. Kia ora, Trini. Thanks. Um, thanks, everybody, for attending today. Um, as Trini said, if you have questions, please put them in the box. We had a few questions sent ahead of time, so we'll try to address some of those questions um, in today's discussion. And... Um, and what I don't address in the discussion or in, in the presentation, I'll just, we'll discuss um, after the presentation. But as you put questions in this chat box, we will answer those at the end of the presentation. Uh, uh, this talk's not about farm environment planning per se. It's about after you get your farm environment plan done um, and we've got a few years till everybody has to have them done. What are you, how do you put wetlands and how do you add wetlands into your plan and, and how do you prioritize your wetlands? Uh, it's a little bit around your, your thought processes around wetlands and, and what to do and, and how to manage wetlands in it. So eventually you'll get a farm environment plan. It'll be a stack of, of papers with a lot of information on and it can be quite daunting, but and it, it, a farm environment plan has basically several different fact, uh, several different pieces to it. First, it's it's basically a map of your your property, identification of risk and critical source areas. These critical source areas, we'll have a little bit of a chat about a little later, and how wetlands fit in around those. A nutrient budget, usually that's done with overseer. 
stock exclusion planning, and we'll discuss stock exclusion planning throughout the, the presentation around your wetlands. Good management practices. If you've got a good provider, they'll provide you a list of good management practices to add. And we'll talk about some good management practices around wetlands. And then this is what really I'm, I want to have a little bit of chat about action list. How do you set an action list around wetlands on your property? How do you protect wetlands? Um, how do you restore wetlands? How do you create new wetlands? That kind of thing. And, and where you prioritize these um, wetlands as you do it. Because when you get your farm environment plan, it's it could be daunting. And you're like, oh, I've got all this to do. But you got time to do it. And if you plan it and prioritize things, it, it's actually not that daunting. This um, wetlands are extremely important um, because we only have 10% of them left and um, and the government has recognized that. And part of the freshwater policy statements um, in the policy number six, six um, there's no further loss of extent in natural inland wetlands. And I'll just that natural inland wetlands is, is, is important um, around this freshwater policy statement. Their values are protected, and it's not just their biological values and um, their landscape values, but also the cultural values are protected. Um, it's it's incredibly important that we include all values when we're protecting it, and the restoration is promoted. Um, so, this is this is the baseline around your farm environment plan. This is what's why wetlands are going to be an important part of your farm environment plan because of this policy. The policy refers to the Resource Management Act of 1991, which is currently looking at being replaced, but um, right now we're working under this. And it defines a wetland as permanently or intimately wet areas. And, and um, we all recognize those permanent wetlands where the, where the ground is just wet all the time, but this intermittently wet areas are actually those wetlands that um, are wet during the winter time and through the early part of the growing season and um were the first ones that we we lost pretty much because they have the easiest of drains but they are actually really important for a lot of of wildlife and stuff like um mudfish and that kind of thing really surviving those intermittently wet areas and so basically there's shallow water generally less than than a, a meter deep um and and sometimes the water's at or below the ground le level um, and then they they also include those land water margins, um, and and that's that's lake systems, especially in Bay of Plenty where you have the lakes. The lakes themselves aren't considered a wetland because they're uh, um, they're deep water habitats, but the edge of the lake where you've got a wetland vegetation growing are considered um, wetlands and are defined as wetlands under this act. And more importantly. Um, and and the reason why they're they're important is because of the plants and animals that are adapted to those wet conditions, like as I mentioned, mudfish. Um, but a lot of times we identify wetlands based on the plants that are adapted to those areas. But uh, most of our threatened and endangered species um, in New Zealand are wetland dependent, uh, um, bittern and rails and that kind of thing. So, and even our native fish are wetland, are wetland dependent. So that's why they are critical. And when we lost. 90% of it, um, we we really need to protect what we have left. I liken it to everybody calls wetlands the, the liver of, of this, the environment that you know, the wetlands take up nutrients and deal with, with things. But when you, um, if your liver, if you lost 90% of your liver in your body, you wouldn't be a healthy person. And the land around us isn't healthy because we lost a lot of our, our wetlands. There's a little bit of confusion and in, and in, um, in, in the press and stuff lately around um, what the the new rules and regulations around natural inland wetlands, and I'll clear up some of that. Um, the first one is is it doesn't include wetlands that are constructed by artificial means, and basically those are those duck ponds that, that you built on your property. Uh, some of the the wetlands you built just for aesthetic reasons, or you put a wetland um, just below your house, just you know those kind of things that you 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 built aren't included in those legislation, so they don't fall under some of the rules and regulations. So, um, geothermal wetlands uh, they're generally mostly always pr protected, anyways, and and it's they're uncommon, although Billy Plenty has a, a few of them around, um, and they're they're incredibly important. They're 
increasingly rare, but um, they fall under different parts of legislation. And then here's the other one that throws a little bit with for people, and it's any improved pasture that on the commencement date, and that's the freshwater policy statements um, dates, which was two years ago, that is dominated by exotic pasture species and subject to rain-derived water pooling. So these are the ephemeral wetlands that um, that we've developed into pad pastures. I think what fed farmers are calling them wet paddocks. And um, so we recognize the importance, but most of them have been changed. So the, the, the policy basically says that those that have been changed previously to the legislation don't fall under this natural inland wetlands. And, um, but you can't do any conversion around those, those um, ephemeral wetlands now because they're actually protected under this policy statement. And, and this, this temporary pooling is, that temporary is sort of a misleading word. Um, these ephemeral wetlands, the water can sit on there for, for a long period of time, long enough that, that terrestrial vegetation won't grow in it. Uh, there's all the legislation around what a wetland is, but there's also the biological aspects of wetlands. And when, from an ecology standpoint, we look at three things when we look at wetlands. We look at the hydrology, we look at the soils, and we look at the organisms that live in that system. Uh, the hydrology plays an important part, or else it wouldn't be called wetland. It's wet land. Um, if, if it wasn't hydrology, it wouldn't be called wet. Um, so... Um, and that's where water is present, the surface or within the root zone of for a portion of the growing season. That, so that portion of growing season includes those ephemeral wetlands. And, and those are plants we call obligate plants. They grow, um, they, they can live in saturated soils and, and do well. Um, so when, when we start looking around what a wetland is, we look at what that biota is. Hydric soils are basically saturated soils. Uh, the most common hydric soil everybody's familiar with are peat soils, um, but there's a whole lot of different waterlogged soils. Um, they all sit together, but a lot of times we, because we're visual, we're more visual um, species, we look at the biota that's there, the, the plants that are living there to identify the wetland and then to back it up with the soils and the hydrology. Restoration, um, just some terms because we're going to make some terms through here. Wetland restoration refers to the return of the wetland to its former condition. Um, the, the ecologists have been arguing around this a little bit more and more. We've changed the, 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 the word around because a lot of wetlands we can't, we can't put back to a formal condition because the landscape around them's changed, but it's actually restoring it back to where the hydrology is, is, is functioning properly. Creation is actually establishing wetlands where wetlands were, weren't before. Uh, a constructed wetland um, is basically a subset of created wetlands, and, and they're artificial wetlands. Generally, they were used to treat municipal and industrial waste, gray water, stormwater runoff, but, um, but we're using constructed wetlands more and more to deal with surface water rough runoff on farms to improve water quality, and we'll talk about that a little bit. And in and wetland enhancement, a lot of people who are planting uh, it, enhancements usually is around planting wetlands with with tree species or, or species that no longer occur there, and, and or establishing um, wildlife that didn't that um, weren't there um, that have been lost from the system. And I liken this to you know you buy a classic car um, if you just paint it. It looks nice, and that's the enhancement part. But if you don't do work on the interior and the engine and restore it, um, it's not a full restoration. So you get your farm environment plan from your land management officer or your um, farm advice provider, and it's got this whole document. You get your maps. You take a look at your maps. And where do you, well, how do you prioritize how you do things, when you do things, and that kind of thing? So top priority on any property is, is protecting that existing wetland. Usually that protection is stock exclusion. Um, but yeah, making sure that wetland is protected and not um, further damaged from anything in the future. And that is highest priority because... Like I said, we only have 10% left. We need to protect what we still have left. 
Fencing to exclude stock is, is, is generally the best practice. However, if some wetlands are in floodplains and it's really hard to get fencings established around those wetlands. Temporary fencing is probably an option for that. And we're getting better and better, um, easier um, systems to put in temporary fencing um, when we put stock close to these wetlands. And in general, um, under the policy statements, you can't um, do a lot of herbicide spr spraying and that kind of thing within 10 meters of wetland. And actually, I, I, I recommend landowners actually put that 10 meter as their buffer around a wetland and fence that 10 meter buffer. The bigger your buffer around the wetland, the more you protect it because the wetlands evolved around with a, most wetlands evolved around with a forested habitat around them. And just adding a little bit of, of terrestrial forest around it will actually protect that wetland a little bit more. So protecting the wetland is first priority. So you look at your farm plan and say, well, over the next 10 years, this first couple of years, I'm gonna spend my time and effort in um, excluding stock and, and putting that fencing in. What's next to your priority is, is identifying, and, and you might be able to identify those with your farm environment plans, your, your damaged or your um, drained wetlands and restoring those. And since we've only got 10% left, it's nice to actually restore wetland, wetlands we can to increase um, the number of wetlands we have. And usually that's fixing hydrology. And then after you get the hydrology fixed, a little bit of planning and stock exclusion. Again, um, these are your two highest priorities when you're looking at your your, your farm environment plan um, because they're important. By protecting your existing wetlands, they actually do a good bit of removing nutrients. And the same way when you restore your wetlands, they also help um, remove a lot of nutrients from uh, the surface runoff. If you're in a catchment that has been identified by the council's uh, high nutrient catchment, mainly um, nitrogen and phosphorus, you might wanna look at creating new wetlands and, and dealing with constructed wetlands and putting some constructed wetlands in to deal with, uh, with improving water quality. Uh, just to reiterate my points, um, not all wetlands have any uh, have open water in. This is a beautiful wetlands and there's not a bit of open water in it. Um, some exotic grasses in it, unfortunately, but native sedges and it's it's nice, simple thing for the landowner to do is actually fence off this wet and, and the landowner has fenced off the wetland. He's actually fenced off the hillside too to, to allow that to revegetate in the native bush. But it's it's the minimum we can do to protect our wetlands. One thing that isn't covered that are important that isn't covered under the legislation because they're so small is seepage wetlands. Uh, the legislation pretty much identifies wetlands that are half hectare or, or larger, and um, seepage wetlands generally are tiny and small. But research done by Darian Zed and Niwa have shown that these actually seepage wetlands are actually good at removing nutrients and um, are really need to be protected to help remove nutrients. And after they're protected, they're actually really easy to maintain. The, the best thing to do is the seepage wetland um, is, is basically a fence. If it has native vegetation in this one is native sedges growing up in it in that light green, um, it's doing its job. And, and the reason these things work so well at removing nutrients is because it slows water down through it the surface, the soil is saturated, so you get that anaerobic area for denitrification and that kind of thing. So with with anything, you got to look at cost benefits. What what are the advantages and disadvantages of of doing things, um, doing work around wetlands on your property? And so when you're looking at your farm environment plan, you're like, well, we got to protect this. That's obvious, but you know. We've got these seepage wetlands. What are the advantages of us protecting it? Is it worth it? That kind of thing. Um, the advantages basically they're low cost, just a little bit of fencing, usually maybe some planting, um, like put some cabbage trees, some more sedges in there, that kind of thing. Any landowner can do it. It doesn't require a lot of expertise. After it's after it's um, fenced and and protected, it's just very little maintenance cost. And um, the fencing uh, checking is you do that ever regularly on your fences anyway. So it's just a little extra time to check your fences. 
one of the big benefits is actually there's small land requirements. So you're not fencing off a large area. It's a small piece of area that's actually not productive. So you're not losing productive land. It has a possibility, even though they're small, it can enhance biodiversity values. What we're finding in um, in some places here um, during the dry times of the year when the steam streams start drying out, our tuna or eels will go into these seepage wetlands and they'll bury in, burrow into them. And then they sit there until the rain comes and the streams start filling back up and then they'll migrate out. So to has some biodiversity values. Also, if you plant them up with some, say, cacatillas and, and cabbage trees, they provide little islands for movement of, of native birds across the landscape. Every wetland we do um, will help reduce downstream flooding in the future. They, they just slow water off the landscape. Uh, disadvantages, um, uh, most of the, most, unless you're doing constructed wetlands, none of your wetlands will handle high strength affluence. Um, we've been playing around with putting weirs in seepage wetlands to increase their, um, their ability to remove nutrients. If you do that, um, there is a little bit of maintenance cost, but again, it's not that much. Advantages of restoring a wetland, basically, um, most wetlands that are that have been drained are in poor production areas. Um, so there's not a lot of loss of of productive land. It's usually generally not well drained. and um you know, in the winter time, stock it stuck in it, that kind of thing. Once it's restored and you get some planting done, actually, it's really easy to maintain. It's a little bit of weed control sometimes and that kind of thing. but if the system's right, the weed control becomes minimal. Uh, really, they're actually lower cost than a constructed wetland. Most of the restored wetlands I've worked on in in, in New Zealand, in the North Island here, have always ranged between about three thousand to um, twelve or thirteen thousand um, for the the restoring the hydrology, and then um, the planting's a, a whole different story. But planting costs can get high in some, depending upon what kind of condition your wetlands in. Again, since we only have 10% left, every little bit of wetland we add to um, what's existing increases its biodiversity value, especially for some of our threatened species like tuna, um, bittern, rails, uh, and our native fish. And again, reduces down sea funding. Um, when you restore a wetland, some wetland restoration might require a resource consent. Again, you just have a chat with your land management advisors um, and they'll be able to to provide you with, with the advice if you need a consent or not. There's a whole lot of techniques we have available for restoring wetlands that go from actually fairly simple and inexpensive to actually get quite um, quite expensive. But uh, the base one we that I do most of the time is around filling drainage ditches. That's probably the most important one. Although now we're seeing that um, with what's going on with the with Gabriel and that kind of thing. Some of the wetlands to restore them, we might have, have to excavate some fill that's come down. And um, and really restoring those buffers and actually connection between the wetlands and adjacent waters is, is probably one of the biggest things that it helps us when we restore because it just helps improve water quality. Very typical seam I see on a lot of farms, especially hill country farms. We got nice rolling hills, and we got these this slight sloped semi flat area that is, and you can see there's several drains flowing through that area, uh, and it's it's basically a drained wetland. And when you look at the hillside, you look at the grass growing on that hillside and how productive that grass is, and you go down, you look how scrubby this wetland is, and you can say, well, actually, the production there is very low. And you look at the hillside there and you think, well, that's wetlands actually catching a, a significant amount of water. If we restore that wetland, we'll have nice clean water coming out the end that goes into the stream. The stream follows those totoras down there. Um, it's basically a drainage ditch down there that goes through those totoras. But here's a really good opportunity, not losing a lot of productive lands and um, improving water quality. And, and a, a site like this is actually big enough to actually have really good biodiversity values. Constructed wetlands. Again, constructed wetlands are created wetlands, generally not in areas that um, that wetlands existed before. 
they do have a high ecological value, even though they are constructed, they do have some, some value, um, not only just water quality, but also some habitat um, available. But they range from, uh, construct a range, uh, range from very simple to very complicated. And um, you do have opportunities to treat high contaminated, um, high contamination and, and you treat it effluent actually with constructed wetlands. Uh, so around the world, there's some constructed wetlands are usually um, 12 to 15 different wetland cells that the effluent goes through. And by the time the effluent goes through and the water comes out the bottom, it's clean enough to drink. And I, I've known a few guys who actually drink the water out of the bottom um, just to prove how clean it is. And generally, they require a high retention time uh, of, of that effluent and, and, and effluent moves through a meter a day. The, the constructed wetlands we'll talk about today aren't those type of constructed wetlands we're talking about this, taking surface runoff off paddocks. Um, but any constructed wetland basically requires large, uh, large land requirement, uh, mainly because the size the, that are required for them and you need flat land. So you, you might be, have to take out some productive land. Um, because there's no wetland there before, you probably don't need a consent, but um, the size of them, you might need a consent because of land disturbance um, and, and moving a soil for land disturbance. So again, um, you need to really talk about to land management advisors and, and construct a wetlands, you need to actually talk to engineers. So you, you're going to have a, a little bit of thing. There is maintenance issues with it because usually there's piping involved and maintaining those pipes are always a, a bit and the high construction cost. Um, and I've seen constructed wetlands going from 80,000 to $360,000 um, here in New Zealand. So um, it's it's not something to take lightly. So when we're looking at wetlands to remove nutrients, especially constructed wetlands, we want, we basically the size of the wetlands is the critical part, not necessarily how 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 fast the water moves through it. So we're looking at a one to five percent of the catchment area um, for sizing the wetlands, and that includes even created or, or that includes restored wetlands and stuff. If if you got a restored wetland that's that's in that one to five percent of the catchment above it, um, it will do a really good job at removing nutrients. Uh, constructed wetlands so basically we're talking about surface flow, so um, the flow across the ground there. And when we construct them, they're usually elongated multi-stage systems with inlets, outlets, um, usually ovals, and, and they've got a length width ratio of five to one to 10 to one. Um, there's usually a pattern to them. We usually have an open deep sediment pond at the, at the top of the wetland. Then you got a shallow 300 mil, average 300 mil shallow wetlands. Which, which gets densely vegetated with, with plants that are adapted, wetland plants that are adapted, they grow out of, out of the water. Ralpo is, is, is a classic example, but all our rushes and um, some of our sedges are, are that. And, and, and then you go back into another deep water area. So we want, when you're looking at for optimal um, removal of nutrients, we're looking at about 70% of the wetland area being shallow with that heavy, densely vegetated zone with uh, with thirty percent being open water, the open water does a, a a lot of things. But the one thing nice thing that open water does is it allows for sunlight to to um, UV sunlight to hit the um the water, and that that helps reduce E. coli. And I know in some places in, in um, Bay of Plenty, E. coli is a, a a concern. Here's a typical constructed wetlands multi cells. This one has five cells. The, the stream actually comes through the um, Kekatea forest there into a sediment pond. Beautiful remnant Kekatea forest, by the way. Um, and then into a into the deep water at the at the top end of a wetland. Uh, and obviously, this one's not filled, but this is planted up with with wetlands um, with rushes. And that's what these guys are doing. And then another deep area goes into another cell. And then um, the pipes haven't been put in yet, but there's pipes transferring from cell to cell. Uh, this cost was high in this wetland, mainly because they had to excavate out and they had to move that soil up here. They excavate soil out here and lay it out and spread it out. 
And that just adds to all the costs and the building of the dike systems. So they're not cheap and, and require a little bit of thinking through. This one has a, a bypass doing high flows. It bypasses the wetland. Like, like Gabriel, like we had here, we, the wetland's not designed to handle those flows. So to protect the wetland, we have a high flow area. Uh, similar, um, sometimes they're actually not that expensive to do. This is a, a, a drain system that we just put a small bund in and, and pipe system through. And so the water would, came, would block the drain up here. The water would come through and then out through that pipe system into the next wetland cell. And then the pipes actually over here, we block the drain again and put a pipe through there. So the water goes sideways through these wetlands and, and through. And this one was a little inexpensive because basically we had to excavate some soil and we just threw it up here. We didn't move it too long, which restricted the size. Um, these buns are actually only um, a half meter high. And they've got a sloping side instead of a, a, a typical dam where you got a one to three slope, we got a one to six slope. So we got a gradual slope on both sides. And the reason we put those gradual slopes in is that we didn't have we couldn't put a bypass in to bypass high flows. And so when we have big rain events, the flow will sheet flow over that whole bund. And that one to six slope allows for those that water to flow over without any erosion. And these these this wetland was put in last year. And um, the landowner called me right after Cyclone Gabriel came through um, and, and said uh, the, the water worked perfectly, went over. There was no damage to the wetland. It, actually, the water went over into the paddock. It was so high. Um, so uh, by putting those one to six slopes, it just protects that wetland for a long time. And you just got to maintain, if you got pipes, you just got to make sure they're, they're open and clear. And again, we got some deep water habitat here and some deep water here where the water is going to come in over here um, and then move through this wetland, deep water. And then down there, as you can see where the deep water habitat is, where the pipe's going to go. Because constructed wetlands are very costly because of this and size requirements, a lot of what we've been doing and with some groups is actually looking at small fields and putting smaller wetlands in at the end of fields. So this this is a wetland, um, deep water habitat, shallow, deep. This was just put in um, a couple months before. But this is a seven-tenths of a hectare wetland treating about a 15-hectare um, hillside slope. And basically, we use some scrubby gully areas that had some flat areas onto it that we're just mucky in the winter time. The landowner just didn't want to deal with, with it. And so he wanted to create a little bit of a wetland. So instead of building big ones, we're building small ones at the end of the fields. Um, and a, another typical end of field one, we got tile drainage in this paddock. This is the Pomahaka um, down in Otago. The tile drain comes into a sediment pond. And you can see the algal growth there indicating there's some nutrients um, in the water. And then it goes through the wetlands um, down and into a culvert and into the stream. So, and, and this one worked pretty well for the Pomahawka guys. They, they got some really good nutrient retention out of this wetland. And then this is, the, um, somebody asked this uh, around um, previously before this, um, before this presentation around drainage ditches and, and um, in, in the Kaituna area. And uh, just use an example, this is actually done in the Waikato. And basically what we do is we expand, we widen the drainage ditch and we put shallow shells of water in to plant up with native vegetation. Drop down here, we create a wetland basin. This, this is all flat over in this side. That's all gonna be a wetland. Kept the original drain in. That drains an overflow doing high flows. It'll go through there, but this whole basin and this over here, is lower. So doing normal flows, the water just slowly moves through these wetlands. Up here at the top, there's actually a sediment trap. There's actually open water here too. And then on the other side, there's actually an open water pond. But very simple and easy to do. And again, we didn't lose any productive land on this is a dairy farm. Um, this was it's just a wet boggy area that was that um they that we just enhanced into a wetland. Another drain we did, um, this one, because most drains have 
uh, um, are sloped and wetlands aren't really work well for slopes and we want to maintain water level at, at that 300 mil. Um, we put these little grade control structures in. These are just compacted clay grade, grade control structures just to keep that slope shallow enough to keep water in there. And again, the main part of the drains here, but we put in a shelf, a shallow shelf of, of, for vegetation, um, created a basin wetland here, put another grade control in, and then a, a, a larger basin down here. And so we can put wetlands in, in the drainage system without really reducing or impacting the productivity of surrounding land. Uh, there's a trick to it, um, and we got to know what you, a lot um, that we don't back up water and, and reduce your drainage, your paddocks. So, so there's a little bit of concern around it, but we've been able to do it fairly successfully. If you're interested in constructed wetlands, NIWA's uh, and Chris Tanner are, uh, Chris Tanner's the experts for New Zealand. Um, he knows more about constructed wetlands than anybody in New Zealand. And he's put a couple guides together. Then the latest is this constructed wetland practitioner guide that he put together with, with Dairy NZ. Um, well worth a look at. And, and in the back, it actually has um, has a, a bunch of case studies and costings for a constructed wetland. So back to your farm environment plan a little bit. Um, you've protected your, your existing wetlands. You've identified and restored wetlands. Long-term, you're in this high nutrient um, catchments uh, or you just want to put more wetlands in. Um, where do you put them? You start looking at your mapping and, and here's a classic case for potential wetlands. And this is where um, will be identified on your maps, usually as this low area here will be identified as a critical source area. And the reason it's identified as a critical source area because um, any nutrients on the landscape on this paddock will flow down into this area and concentrate in this area. So these critical source areas are actually pretty cool, pretty neat places to put wetlands. As you can see, the grass growth is okay here, but it's not the greatest. And putting a little end of the field wetlands um, in here would be an ideal place to put it without a lot of loss of production. And and basically, you know, for for three to five thousand for the two to the work, and then another ten um, for plants. You could have a beautiful little wetland that's actually treating the end of your field. Uh, one thing to be said, because I'm talking to the Bay of Plenty, um, you've got to have good soils for a wetland. Um, if you got some, um, if you don't have um, clay or a high silt level in your soils, um, you you might not be able to do it. And I know some of Rotor Road has is, is got well drained soils, so um, that limits what you can do in, in those those areas. All my wetlands, when I do the work, I put sediment traps in because I want to protect my wetlands from sediment because if sediment's moving into the wetland, it's going to drop off in your wetlands. And in a few years, your wetland will actually be dry terrestrial land because of all the sediment going in. So I put sediment traps in. You can see the sediment trap here. It's got a whole bunch of algal growth, which means there's some nutrients coming into it. Um, and and it's it's doing its job. When you put a sediment trap in, just make sure that you have access to get a digger in that can reach across and clean out your sediments from your sediment trap, and and um, or else you 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 might end up with a full sediment trap, no way to remove sediment, and then sediment ends up in your wetland. Because of the high cost and high land values of a constructed wetland, um, I I do a lot of what I call treatment chains. Um, we find, and this is what well, you've seen the picture of this one, but I'm just showing you, we've got basically a sediment trap. We've got this area here that um, is grass right now, but it's going to be planted in, in flaxes and cabbage trees and native sedges um, with a little cacatillas in too for biodiversity. And then into your wetland. This, this area here, because of us putting the wetland in, is going to stay wet. So it's actually acting like a seepage wetland. So we're going to actually end up with removal of nutrients. It's going to go into what we've constructed um, where that log is, is actually open water because the landowner wanted some open water in front of his little shed there. Um, so he could sit out there and have lunch and, and um, enjoy the wetlands and the biodiversity. 
into shallow water habitat. Unfortunately, it does. It looks like it's deep water, but it is shallow water, and the reeds and rushes will come in over the next few years, and then down into another wetland series down below. Um, so we've stretched this wetland, elongated it, and fitted it into the landscape. Again, another gully system. We we put a wetland up here at the top, and we've got basically this area here that is acting as a seepage wetlands. And then we've created a little bit of deeper water habitat and, and took this organic soil and, and made it a small bond, just to slow water down through there. But that's all topsoil. So the, seep, the water will seep through that topsoil and that um, is all grown up in native um, sedges and, and that kind of thing. So we're getting nutrient removal through into another low open cell with, with more nutrients removal through and then into a, a nice shallow wetland with uh, just some deep water habitat at the bottom. This is an old farm dam that went across here that that um that hadn't been maintained and it eroded away and we just we just lowered the dam wall actually um, because we didn't want any deep water we wanted this is this is a meter deep right here at the deepest and then this is all like um 300 to yeah about 300 mils deep through the rest of this but we just used that old dam wall to um as as our thing, we we had to redig it up because it was and, and re, reinstated a little bit, but we didn't do too much to it, and and basically overflow into some undisturbed soil and it dropped back down into the gully system. And so really simple. The the farmer had already fenced off the area. We actually had to take the fence down to do the work, but he fenced off the area because his cows in the winter time get stuck in it um, because it's wet in the winter time, but it dried out in the summer. And now it's going to stay wet year, year round after we did this work. Again, a little bit with treatment chains. Um, and this is it's typical of some of the farms. We've got um, we got an old farm dam above here that we actually lowered again and and, and put a pipe in, but we left we raised it a little bit to act like a stormwater um, pond because we had a big catchment. So it it will it'll blow up and fill up to a meter and a half to two meters deep. And then there was a pipe that actually would re that allowed the water to flow out at a lower controlled rate. So, so it wouldn't blow out our wetlands. And then um, below that dam, we had, we put a wetland in, we put these two wetlands in, and then it went into a drainage system that went through two paddocks. And um, Unfortunately, um, we got we get really clean water, but then you go through these two paddocks and you get runoff from those paddocks that increase the nutrient levels in the water. So what we did is at the end of the drain, we put another wetland in at the end of the drain just to polish off um, any nutrients it picked up from runoff from the other two paddocks. So we're we we're getting away that from that large lands. Um, you still need large land, but we're actually trying to find places in the landscape to stick them that we don't lose production. And with that, we will open it up to some questions. Tarini. Uh, thank you, Nathan. That was certainly um, uh, lots of learning for me in terms of um, establishing wetlands, the best uh, way to identify that uh, space where you can uh, construct, create, or uh, restore wetlands um, for those of us that are tuning in. Uh, is, if there's no questions in our box at the moment, um, but yep. if you do have any um, questions, please pop them in there now. I just want to add to all of that information and what a wonderful presentation, thanks Nathan, uh, that there's a resource that's been put out, it's called Te Reo o Te Repo, The yep. Voice of the Wetlands, um, and that documents that document, sorry, was uh, released in about 2017. It was led by the Lanky Research. Um, do you know much about that, Nathan? Yeah, I do. It's a nice little document. Um, and um, yeah, and also um, Manaki Fenua Lanky Research has put a, a wetland restoration document together um, that is, is quite useful too. Yep, so I encourage everybody that's tuned in to um, go and have a look. It's got it's a really um, comprehensive resource that's going to cover cover um, a te ao Māori perspective, an Aotearoa perspective on repo. Um, so that's all about the connections, understandings, um, and learnings for the restoration of our wetlands. Yep. 
We've just had another question come through, Nathan. Yep. Um, and that is, what is the recommended weed control product for uh ah, or, Yep. For weed uh, and the rules and regulations around um, weed control and wetlands are getting a little bit tough right now. You can't do a lot of spraying, um, but I think they're working around those rules now. Um, generally, councils and, and you'll have a chat with your council, like glyphosate's usually allowed to be used um, or over water, um, but hand spraying is probably your, your best bet in, in spot spraying because um, it, it does... Um, it does have an impact, but um, unfortunately, glyphosate only kills certain species, and it'll 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 it won't get rid of of like glyceria, alligator weed, that kind of thing, and and, um, and those really need to sit down with regional council, get around some um, consents, and and develop a management plan around your wet, wetlands, and um, yeah, and there is um, Bay of Plenty does. Um, have a thing around wetland management plans on your property where the council will put together wetland management plan and and, and around weed control and stuff. Um, but yeah, some of those weeds, uh, glyceria, alligator weeds, um, you guys have all kinds, require some really nasty chemicals. Um, yep, uh, and will need uh, consent to do um, to do work on it. Uh, sometimes, though, to be honest with you. If if we can get the wetland hydrology right and the native plants a time to establish, they can out compete a lot of, of weeds. We treat weeds as a um as as a um as the disease, but they're actually a symptom of a disease uh, on most parts. And if we can figure out why the weeds are taking over, um, we might be able to tweak that system enough to actually um, don't have to deal with with dealing with the um with the symptoms uh, or, you know, we can deal with, with the main thing and, and not just the weeds. And, and sometimes it's just the hydrology is not right on it. But I've been up in Northland and we're see uh, when I was up there, we were just starting to see that um, alligator weed wasn't competing well with the native rushes and stuff. And once the native rushes established um, it's, and parrot feather was another one. Um, it was still in the system, but it wasn't becoming a, a noxious weed. Um, and they tend to, go into systems that are not in balance and tweaked. So, um, and it's not, that's that's a general observation is not a rule because there's some weeds that that just um, are a, a problem. So um, have, a, have a think about it and, and talk to your land management advisors around it. Uh, the next question here, Nathan, how are the benefits of wetlands quantified in the context of a FEP? Uh, it depends upon your provider. <laughs> um, unfortunately, um, the standard around farm environment plans hasn't been um, hasn't been finalized yet, and and uh, you different providers provide different um, a, a different level of um, of expertise, um, and hopefully, and this is I think why um, the governments and the councils have sort of slowed down on the farm environment planning. And not pushing it right now uh, as much as because they're trying to get the the tweaking of it right. Um, your provider should be able to say, "Hey, you know, um, these are our, our, our benefit." And you'll see an overseer, and and we've been having this discussion with the guys who developed overseer. Overseer will recognize the wetlands um, and their importance in the removal of nutrients, um, but they will not. Uh, um, the last time I looked, the only recognized wetlands that were a hectare or larger. Um, so like when I'm doing those treatment chains, the overseer won't recognize those. Uh, they are working on changing those and, and that will help you understand the importance. You, it'll help you quantify the importance of your wetlands for nutrient removal. I hope that was what you're getting at. Um, the next question here, how onerous have you found gaining resource consents? And thermal, 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 thermal yep. sorry, <laughs> flow paths returning to wetlands. Um, <laughs> uh, it varies from council to council, and and what you want to do, um, and 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 rules and regulations, um, yeah. So you've got your farm environment 
or you know, you've got your freshwater policy statement, and but your regional council plans, um, whichever one stricter takes um, takes precedent um, around it. Nor uh, a consensus that I've done in Northland was pretty easy and straightforward. Consensus I've done in other regions have been really convoluted mm -hmm. and, and and challenging. Um, However, if you've got a good land management officer from your regional council there, they will walk you through it pretty quickly. Um, and uh, most councils, and I know, um, because I was talking to a few council people at the Bay Plenty um, not too long ago, they're really trying to figure out better ways of of um, of making this the consent process less onerous um, and and that kind of thing. And and Waikato Council is, is a classic example of if if for the first uh, amounts um, of of consents that come in that um, are provide environmental benefit, they waive the fees um, up to I can't remember it was like a hundred thousand dollars worth of consents or something like that. So they're they're trying to make it easier for for farmers to do things. It's a um, it's a little bit of a tough world to make those decisions, um, environmental benefits, and still making sure that things are done properly and 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 councils are still waiting through those i would say the near future is actually pretty good um around that yes once we say consents to anybody um it always gets a funny reaction yeah. um we've just had one more come through here and then we'll close out from there right so if you've yep. got anything else um please pop it in now otherwise we'll be in touch after the um, presentation. So following on from the quantification of EPP's question, do you find council accept wetlands as a response to high modelled nutrient loading? For example, dry stock station cannot afford to fence a hundred hectare hill country but want to construct a significant wetland at the bottom of the catchment. Can you quantify the effects capturing sediments and overland flow? Oh yeah, yeah. And and um this is this comes into you know um, yeah hill country is always a tough one um, and one one thing that we're finding um, in hill country and um, MPI has done a lot of research on is is actually instead of fencing or articulation is is a way of keeping livestock away from your streams and and wetlands and stuff because if they got good clean water and, and troughs they tend to to um, to use that instead of getting in your streams and your wetlands. Um, yeah, there is, like I said, overseer actually can model a lot of that. Um, and um, there has been a lot of research actually in the Bay of Plenty done by um, um, the Bay of Plenty Regional Council, especially around sediment capture and, and detainment buns. And uh, they were able, there's a lot of, of, of resources around that modeling and, and the Bay of Plenty um, the Bay Plenty Regional Council um, has some of that modeling already. So, you know, just get in touch with them and, and they'll be able to to, to point you in the right direction. Um, but um, there's attainment buns and and, um, and the research around that in the Bay of Plenty is actually really good and, and really has that modeling already done. Um, this, the, the tools are there. Um, it's just, yeah, just talking to the right people, the council to get those tools and, and make those decisions. Um, Trini, uh, there was one. There was actually two questions that were sent in ahead of time. I'd, I'd like to just address real quick. Okay. And one asked: are, are there many farmers working the carbon sequester, working carbon sequestration into their plans? And yes, um, when it comes around to, to wetlands, carbon sequestration is that's relatively new. We're still waiting on the research on how well wet, uh, we know wetlands sequester carbon. And and um, we know that peat wetlands are really good at it, but uh, other freshwater wetlands, the knowledge isn't there. It's being worked on right now. So um, we'll probably see more and more incentives around wetlands for carbon sequestration in the near future. If you're down in a um, in an estuary in the area, we we call that blue carbon, and um, there's a lot of research around that, and and um, the Nature Conservancy's been doing a lot of, of carbon sequestration around um, 
estuaries and that kind of thing right now in New Zealand. And um, as there's a really big wind around those those um, those saltwater marshes and that kind of thing. Um, so it's just a space to keep your eye on. And there was another one here that um, somebody asked about drainage improvement and low and drainage. Um, uh, there's a lot of research going on right now. And actually, if you go to the New Zealand Link Care Trust's um, YouTube sites, uh, I did a, a whole webinar on, on um, lowland drains and drain ch um, channel improvement for biodiversity and water quality uh, that is on, on there, which will get you started on things. And um, I think that's it, Trini. Fabulous. Well, well, that brings us to an end. Um, it's a whānau tuning in. Um, e re re ana te mihi ki a koe, Nathan, thank you very much for taking the time to come and have a kōrero um, with the webinar today. Uh, hopefully everybody um, has um, learned something new like myself regarding wetlands um, and FEPs, farm environmental plans. From here, um, please get in touch if you require any more um, information, if you've got any questions, if you'd like to be connected to uh, any other expertise, there's also your local regional council LMOs um, to go to. Uh, after the presentation, we're going to be putting uh, this recorded all into a YouTube link, so it'll be recorded and you'll be able to re-watch it should you want to go back to um, any of the information. Uh, before we close out, there's just a whakatauki, it's uh, Matini Mamano Karapate Fai, and that reminds us of the power of many working towards a common goal. So all of the threads of work that we're doing, for those of us tuned in, uh, myself and Nathan, all contribute to the well-being of our whenua and our wai, our land and our waterway. With that, I'm going to close with a karakia, and we hope everybody has a fabulous Friday and a wonderful weekend. Unuhia, unuhia, unuhia ki te uru tapa nui ki a māma ki a wātea te hiningaro te tinana te ngākau. Ko ia e rongo e whakiri ake ki rungara. Haumi, hui, aiki. Kia ora tātou. Yep. Thank you.